Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> It's Thursday. It's the podcast. It's the Two Shot Podcast. I'm Craig Parkinson and you're you doing whatever you're doing right now. Maybe you're on a train. Maybe you're at the gym. Maybe you're just going, I'm just putting my feet up. I'm going to have a listen to this. Wherever you're doing, you're welcome. So it's episode 49. And so a few months ago, I uh, get suggestions from people, as I always do on social media. Some are are doable, some are are impossible, and some are just frankly ridiculous. Look, I'd love to have Steven Seagal on the podcast, but, you know, working dates out with that might be a bit tricky. Now, one of the suggestions we had was Jimmy Akimbola. But this person didn't know is that I was already in touch with Jimmy and we were working out dates because he spends time in LA and he's over here. And of course, we're constantly running episodes of the podcast and recording. So it's finding dates and time as it is with all our guests. So this is it. Now, I had never met Jimmy. I first met Jimmy about a month before we recorded the podcast. We were on a panel at the BFI. And I met him in the green room and we immediately just gravitate towards each other. He is so much fun, so infectious, so positive and truthful. And I loved spending time with him and I loved recording this episode. And I think you're going to love hearing it. There's a lot of love there, a lot of love for Jimmy. So please do whatever you're doing. Slow down on that treadmill. Close your eyes on that tube, put your feet up, pop the cup of tea down if it's too hot. I don't want any accidents. This is episode 49 with the wonderful, infectious Mr. Jimmy Akimbola. I'll see you at the end. I can't believe we got it together at last. I know, mate. I know. I'm literally flying out on Monday. Because that's how when I was in Italy, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I know we said roughly this week... He was taking a piss out of me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I, again, you know, we always arrange dates, not just me and you, but other guests, and you know, yeah. things get in the way. Yeah, yeah. Whether I'm talking to a, an actor or a writer or a poet or a musician, and it just, yeah. think, you know, I was supposed to talk to a musician this afternoon and it is, he got yeah. held up. Yeah, yeah. But there's nothing we can do. It's fine. And yeah. we can redo it. We can always start it and it's, it's all right so going back to LA tomorrow yeah uh, Monday a Monday. Monday yeah yeah going back on Monday and um, yeah sort of been up for a couple of auditions you know is that that could have me here but there's no point in me waiting you know what I mean and to see if I get the jobs I've got to go yeah but you know there's a big chance I could get it and have to come back in a couple of days time but you know I'm a big believer in that you can't play tricks with the mind you know that whole thing uh, just book a random holiday and then you get a job you've actually got to book the holiday that you actually want you know what I mean and then you probably will get a job or get an audition you know you can't sometimes I think you know you can try and play tricks with that sort of I don't know if you're superstitious or not but I'm just like if I stay I feel like I definitely won't get the jobs (laughs) you know I feel like I've got to go and I still might not get the job but if I stay I'm like I'm just trying to and Fuck with in a situation like that, say, you know, you've booked a holiday. Yeah. And you go, right, well, I'm going. I'm going for a week there and that's mm. done. But then if something comes in, would you go, look, I've booked a holiday. I don't care. I'm going to have to put it aside. It, it, it depends what it is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If it's something... Look, if it's, if it's a game changer, of yeah, course yeah, you're going to yeah, sack yeah, the holiday yeah. off. Yeah, but, but if it's that in-between place, I'd probably be like, no, nah, I'm staying. Do you know what I mean? So I meant when I was in Italy, I meant to tell my team, like, look... Don't send me anything. I'm out. You know, I mean, Italy. I've never been to Italy before. My mate's getting married in Tuscany, so I just want to be in the moment, embrace it. And lo and behold, midway through the week, I get auditions come through, and of course. and also looking at the game. I didn't have to do them then. I, was, I actually said, "Look, I'm not going to be able to do this until I'm back." And that thing where it's like, oh, suddenly 
they, 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 it's been extended and you're like come on man all those times where you go, deadline deadlines the tape's got to be in by this time yeah. and I was like it shows you you can always extend or they've got it no this is the only day they're going on this the, I know. really I know. Is, it the, really? is it the only day I know because you're giving me <laughs> about six hours to prep for this <laughs> exactly and you want me off book and I'm a bit oh, I know no. I know I know do you think they even think about that cast and directors do you think I don't know I mean it's something that comes up not just on the podcast, but, you know, in, just in life again and yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, <sighs> You're giving me, you know, a next day date to come in and meet all these other creative people who are making X, Y, and Z, and you need me to learn seven pages, maybe four ten. scenes, maybe yeah. ten, maybe 14, whatever it is. Yeah. <sighs> Is it possible? Do you think that's the only thing that's going on in my life <laughs> uh, at the moment? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, is that, it's, is it's, that going to be, is this, you know, I want to give you the best. Do you think this is the best way to get the best out of me to show you what I can do? <laughs> yeah. And this is like one of your main characters. So you really think this is the way to do it? You yeah. know what I mean? Do you know what I'm going to, there's not enough pressure. And you know, people, you know, in the hierarchy, there are some people that do get that time. You know what I mean? Like, there's a big bolt that do get the same sort of next day things, but there are some people, if they've got the right agent or the right rep, that they might get it a day or two before. You know what I mean? Because I've had it myself. I'm like, oh, God, there's a lot to learn here. Their friend's like, oh, yeah, can you help me learn these lines? I was like, oh, yeah, I'm up for that. He's like, when did you get it? I was like, two days ago. He's like, I got it yesterday. I'm going in tomorrow. You know what I mean? And, and two days is a nice bit of time. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, but when you've got, like, that you say eight to ten pages and yeah. you've got a day it's ridiculous do you feel things like that have changed over the years mm-hmm. Jimmy because I don't I don't remember it being yeah, no, like that I think it has changed I think it has changed I think it's the I think there's less consideration for the actor you know what I mean it's, and we're not being all you know thespian. it's like no come on like you know I'm going to do the work so allow me the time to bring you know do the work and come and do it in the room but when you're giving me a day and like it's a significant part and it's great writing and it's got all these gear changes in it and you know and you want it off book as well and I want to be off book so I want to be free in the moment I don't want to be looking down at the paper so I'm dealing with my own shit as well <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so it's just like oh guys this is not this is I don't know it's, I feel like it's not the best way to get the best actor you know how do mean? you deal with things like that if they give you a very short amount of time yeah do you go Right, I'm going to go for it. Or do you say, look, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't want to look like a Wally in the room because it just reflects badly on me as an actor. <laughs> so, ah, uh, it's a good question. I've got one. My mate, my mate Nicholas Pinnock. You got to get him on here. I was with him the other day. He's like, yeah, oh, I love great. I'll have to do it. He hasn't asked me. You got all a bit. So you're gonna have We'd, to. At the gonna... moment, <laughs> I, I think I met Nicholas once at a, like a do maybe okay, a year right. ago. He's through friends, friends, but we don't have a dialogue. But look, all right. Yeah, I, I told her I, I've mentioned it now. He wants to do it. You know, anyway, got a, a big list of people. <laughs> yeah, he's 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 like he does that a lot. He's like, nah, forget it, forget it. I'm I go for it, and sometimes I go for it. and I'm like, yes, get in, smashed it. You know what I mean? Uh, but there's been a lot of times I've got egg on my face, and I've just ruined myself in front of like showrunners, producers, and because I'm you know ba- I live in LA now most of my time. It's like. You know what I mean? I, I kill some some really good relationships. I can tell my team have talked to me up. Yeah, he's the next. He just <laughs> David and you're the, everybody like. But yeah, you go. That's an Idris. He's everybody. And they're like, yeah, let's see this guy. And then you go in there and you bomb. And then you get that little look in the eyes of like, thank you very much. Thanks you know? for coming in. Great, great. Just that well, little bit of that wide eye which you just gave me there. Like, yeah. great. And then. The door feels like it sort of stretches away. You know, like a cartoon. It goes do 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 So instead of it being a couple of steps to the door, it feels like it's a 10-minute walk to the door. Yeah. And they're all talking about it again. What the hell was that guy doing? Are you good at letting that things go, or would you carry something like that around with you? Because um, it's things like this come up a lot, and some people are very good at going, you know, say la vie, what will be, will be, it's all cool. And some people carry the baggage around, and yeah. they beat themselves up, and... I'm, you know what? I used to be cool about it. I think, I, yeah, I used to be cool about it, but I carried it. I carry it more in America. I 
carry it much more. Why do you think that is in, you, over there? You know what? I love LA and, uh, you know, the opportunities and the lifestyle. But I think once you've, like, been and done a one pilot season, you live there for a year, it's the... Uh, you you go in there as the, the baby mind enters the, the market, right? Oh, this is all new. I'm doing a year's worth of auditions in, in two months, two and a half months. Wicked. And then... And then you like test, so you get close to what you could be, or you might get the job, and then you just know you understand everything. So the next time it comes around, I think you it's hard to not keep the stakes in your head and not be in your head. One, because if you sign if you uh, test, they make you sign everything. Mm. So you see how much money you're gonna get, you see how big the trailer you're gonna get. And how you many know, years how you're many gonna years be doing you're gonna get potentially. Potentially. So, you know, you might be signing on a show you don't really want to be on, but you want to take the money, or you sign on a show that you know this is gonna change be a game changer. But all that stuff that gets in the way of just being in the zone and creative in the room, right? So I feel like it just I find you know, it's trickier to let it go. <laughs> in some place like LA because do you feel you know, the stakes are higher over yeah, there for I, you personally I, I, I feel like that I do feel like that I do feel like that because I've you know I've decided to you know uproot and go and start again like, no one knows Jim McAbola in LA do you know what I mean well they that's why I want that's why what I wanted to ask you actually were you was this a choice that you made because the the, the parts that you wanted to do were available to you here and you felt you wanted to do what Lenny James did all those years ago. Def- definitely, mate. Definitely, mate. Like, and I say it from a point where I've got great, have a great agents. I work and I work, you know, and yeah. I worked and I work. So I'm not, I'm not whining. But then you get to a point where you want to have a career where you're, you know, you're, you're tackling the good roles. You know what I mean? It doesn't always have to be the lead, but you want to stop being the the cameo, the best mate. You know what I mean? You want to start sort of eating. I call it eating apart. Like, I feel like I've always been able to do on, on stage, you know? And, and, and so what I found is that, you know, you know, the industry might say, oh, Jimmy, you've not done enough yet. Do you know what I mean? But then I look at my CV, CV I'm like, well, no, I think I'm due to, you know, yeah, to, to get a little something. Do you know what I mean? And He's talking about taking it to the next level. The next level, yeah. Because you were, if you were here, of course, like, you were doing great theatre yeah, and, yeah. you know, playing something like Christopher and Blue Orange. Yeah. So that is a part that you, as you say, you can eat and really, because of Joe Pennell's right in. There you go. You know, yeah. you've got it there. But to get the equivalent on TV. Here, you were just film, like this and I'm just doing a straight line instead of yeah, a vertical. Yeah. And like my thing was that Holby was a great job for me. Like, and it really enabled me to show what I could do as an actor and away from the comedy stuff that I do and, you know, I was able to sustain a character for three years. So, yeah, you know, you go, you know, the depth of a character, you know, not on the surface, not an in and out job. And I love that, turning up on set every day and, you know, camera work. Even before then, I'd done series and I've been on TV, but I'd never done a year-long series where you're w- waking up at 5 a.m., getting to work at 6.37, and, you know, you're rolling onto set asleep, mm. but you're awake by the camera rolls on. And then there's the, the thing as the actor, is like, oh, man, so I'm tired. They're working me hard. Typical actor thing of like, oh, I want a job. Then you get the job. He's like, oh, what time have I got to start? Moany. Moany, right? Yeah. But, but then what I, what, reali- what I realized is that there was a point where this is, this is what it is for actors that work a lot. And then when you have got a great character and stories are being written for you, you know, you, you cannot take away the, the importance and the joy of being on set every day. And there's the point you forget the camera's there. And then that's, that's when the playing, the freedom comes and then yeah. you learn. You can make mistakes. Oh, that episode was terrible, Jim. I know. I tried something new. Next, next week's episode is going to be different because, you know, you, you're able to look back at your work and see But the how lucky that, that, you that you were doing something like that. That, it, that hobby, it is a machine. It's, yeah. I mean, they're long days. Long days. And you're on once a week. And what is that? They're like, an, an, are they an hour? An hour. Yeah. yeah that's, no advert. So, so that's, a, that's a lot of page count in a day. It was great. Yeah. And I thought it was the best bit of you know training for me you know it wasn't my first tv but working like that but yeah coming out of that i thought the industry to almost go 9 p.m you know what i mean even though i was doing rev at the same time so i was doing crackhead mick and malik at the same time i just like for me to tip it 
over that line. Do you know what I mean? To 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 have a role like you know when I look at like my peers of great people like like Warren Brown, like I love how he's moved through. Do you know what I mean? You know, besides Luther, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that cop show that obviously there was a shooting, so he didn't go ahead. But, yeah. You know, when I look at something like him or Ot Fagunelle and you know David Jesse, you know, I can yeah, it's great. That's the sort of going through the ceiling type of career trajectory I was looking for and I just felt like it wasn't like it was not there but I was going through a very thin space Do you not feel the opportunities were being presented that you could possibly even throw your hat in the ring for sometimes I would just get the call of look it's a straight offer to so and so and we all know each other you know I know you said I could say names but I'm not going to say names (laughs) but but, you know sometimes I'm like all right, okay uh, I sort of guessed that but I was hoping you might at least let you know me and some of the others that we were all different, we were all talented in different ways to come in and, you know, give their version yeah, in of terms course. of the role. And then and then I realized that was happening a lot and uh I said to myself, I can either stay and sort of see what else I can get around that, or I can gamble, which is start again in America, but still it's not that I'm saying bye bye the UK. I've got a great agent, Hamilton O'Dell, so let's self tape. And I risk missing out going in the room here, but actually what I'm getting is a whole new market. You know what I mean? And uh, and I love the challenge. Do you know what I mean, uh, Craig? I love to be challenged. And um, after four months, I got, you know, um, Arrow. Yeah. You know? And yeah, it's CW, it's a, super, it's a Marvel superhero thing, but we don't have anything like that here. The closest thing to that here would probably be Doctor Who, do you know what I mean? Uh, I've never had audition with Doctor Who. <laughs> um, Tim, but- this isn't a podcast where you can scout for auditions, kids. So don't be coming on here <laughs> pleading with casting directors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What else have I not had an audition for? You're right. But I'm just saying, like, you know, four months in and getting a role like that, and it's international. I, do, I think the business brain kicked in for me. I just feel like if you're all actors, but especially if you're an actor of colour, if you're not thinking internationally, I just think, you know, you're, you're a bit behind the game. And I think there's something like Arrow. Yes, it's on in America, but it's on across the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, and the, the scope. America's everything's bigger, right? Fries are bigger, the, the food's bigger, the cars are bigger. Do you like that? I, I do. I do like it because the possibility's bigger for me. Right. When I look at Manic in Holby and I look at Grey's Anatomy or ER, it's, you know, we're trying to do the equivalent of the thing, casually, you know, and I'm just like... I, my career would be a complete different way in the US, you know? And so I like to be in a place where that's possible, you know? And it's inspiring, like Lenny James, Eamon Walker, you know, Idris, you know? And now there's a big new wave of Daniel Kaluuya, yeah. Idris, you know, John Boyega. It's like, it's really exciting time. It's work, though. I'm working my butt off. I'm like, my hit rate's obliterated from, like, having a rough maybe one in three or four, if I dare to say. It's gone to... One in. <laughs> 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 what month are we in now? Do you know what I mean? And that's that's a big test. But again, I am competitive with myself. But I love the lifestyle. I love the sun. I feel like I've been. I love London. I'm from Plaster East London. Been grinding a lot. But there's nothing like waking up. There's sun every day. You don't have to take an umbrella out or and a big coat. It's just like you know exactly what you're gonna get. I've got the hills one side. I can go hiking. I can go to the beach in 30, 40 minutes. And, you know, I go in the rooms of Walking Dead rooms or, you know, Men in Black or Steve Jobs. or the, You know what I mean? It's like I'm going in those rooms and they're considering me. You know, I might not still get the jobs. But I might still, get close. But, but still, but, you feel that over there you're more in the running. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I, re- I really do. I really do. And, um, and it's nice when you are like, you know, you're literally touching distance. With a like, yeah, it's, it's you, it's you, yeah, it's you. And you're like, oh man, this is okay. I'm gonna get this job, and then, all right, it's not you. <laughs> They've gone a different way, but but isn't that just always the way? That is, that That's, is, all, it's part and parcel. That is part of and parcel of it. But I felt like it's harder for me to get in those positions here. Like, but isn't it a shame and scandalous, really, that all those actors that you just mentioned are all mega talented? And absolutely individuals. Yeah. You know, yeah. what Lenny does compared to what Eamon does or yeah. what Idris does. Yeah. All very different, mm. but all fantastic. That they felt they had to go over there mm. to generate the work when we should be t- nurturing homegrown talent over here. It is a shame. It is a shame. I, I, and I wonder, I'm like, what is it? Sometimes I think it's the one in, one out, you know, like. 
we have you know agents in hustle so we, you know we don't need any other sort of other actor in a leading role you know what I mean or I know. you know we, just, we have Luther but okay cool but why can't you have another series where someone else is a lead another drama or you know and, it, and, then, and, then, and then I go not not just force it but like there's not even like content for it either as well it's mm. just like it's so minimal so for me to also be living in LA now I look back I'm like what am I missing you know and I look, I watch all things yeah. a bit of Halifax you know Midwife you know I haven't watched Downton yet but you know I love it you know what I mean um, uh, and yeah I can see lots of shows but it's rare that I see shows with you know some of my peers and friends that I'm like they're brilliant talented yeah. and they're due I'm like well, what are they doing where are they because if I see them and I'm like oh that gives me that's a that's a like a bit of a a monitor of like oh well, Jim maybe you could have gone up for that but I'm not I'm rarely seeing that do you know what I mean and if I do see people there's it's still a bit like the friend or the fourth the fifth and I'm like no you know I'm all about earning your stripes but there's a lot of people do you know what I mean and I'm not just talking about actors of colour or whatever people like yourselves and like it gets to the point where you are you within the list are you on the list Craig you know what I mean no, are you no on the list no one tells me nothing Jim I don't know <laughs> Are you do, you, do, you, do you think anything's changing and moving in the right direction in, in regards to all this? Uh, in terms of here in the UK? Yeah. I've got to be honest with you. No, not really. I feel like there's a lot of talk. And, and not, not a lot enough, of action. Not enough action and mm. doing. I, I I really feel like there's lots of like panel discussions like we were on the other day. Yeah. And, uh, cool, it has to be talked about. But I'm like, I'm tired of talking and no action afterwards, you know? And, um, and um, What do you think needs needs to be done? Because, of course, everything starts with a talk. Yeah, yeah. But as you say, we can fucking talk all day long. <laughs> yeah, I but mean... But if, if, no, if there is no change and nothing's going to happen, what is the actual point? Not that we need to go at it, as me and you have spoken yeah. about, with any sort of anger or aggression. No, no, no. We need to speak openly and calmly and honestly mm. to move upwards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a lot, really. At the, to the top, like, you know, we've talked about, like, the gatekeeper level... Yeah. You know, I think, you know, those people that are saying yes, that are that are picking the content, I think, you know, we, we need to look at, you know, how, you know, diverse and inclusive that group of people are, you know? Because, you know, you might be from a certain place and might not respond, respond to a certain bit of material. And if everybody's from a certain place, and they're, <laughs> then they're only going to be responding to one piece of material. Yeah. And they're not going to be seeing things that, like... That you would see, that I would see, and so if you have a mixture of that, then I would say I'm hoping that would change the type of content that gets commissioned. But then also you got to be open to different content, and then you get into the thing. We're in a smaller pond here, so yes, you know you got your Tony Jordans, your Abby Morgans, and like you know the Moffats, brilliant, brilliant writers. But where's the space for that person that maybe hasn't written anything but has got some serious chops? So what about some script development? And can we? Is there an hour slot? on our channel that we could dictate to yeah. raw great talent. A bit yeah. like, it reminds me that back in the day, you had like Made in Britain and, you know, like TV, there's like gritty dramas. Well, maybe they were big names, but I feel like there could be a place on each channel that was just like, even if it's an hour, or an hour here or a half hour here, that could sort of, but it's got proper budget, it's got yeah. proper team. Yeah. Because the other thing that will happen sometimes where I think, these new things get commissioned. I look at them, I'm like, the money's not in the show. I can look at it. The money's not there. Or, or, or that script isn't speaking to me. Yeah, it's what, not speaking. That's for a certain type of... I, I'm not going to class bash, but it's for... It, well, I, I, how can I yeah. get it with that? Or mm. how's that going to speak mm. to my mob? Or, I know. Or, or, actually, why have you not sort of... Sometimes I think scripts... That, that a script looks like it needs more work. So now you've, you've, you're going, look, we've done something, but you've not really backed it with the money. Yeah. You've not really gave it the support and the script development that it needed. And it's on at 12.30 at night. And it's not that great. And then it doesn't get the viewing figures. And then you're like, whoa, we tried. It's like, no, you didn't try. You or maybe, know I mean? maybe that's why it's on at 12.30 at night. Yeah, well, Barry. Well, 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 that thing, though, that, well, we did something. That's the only stop we had. I feel like sometimes there's a bit of like, now let's not do that. So I think it's the top tier... And then I think it's about, you know, the content, the scripts coming through. And uh, and if some of the big names are not writing it, I get as a channel, you don't want to risk too much, but let's put something in place where you can risk a bit 
so we can get the new names through. Isn't it all about rest, though? It should all be about... We, you know... Look, we're not doctors or heart surgeons. <laughs> but, but, you know, as creative actors, we, t- we, we do take risks. We want to take yeah. risks. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the dangerous element, and that's yeah. where we get excited. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the good... That's where a lot of good new content comes mm. from, you know, from the risk and, and you know, and, and new voices to push boundaries and, you know, change the game in some way. So, um, so yeah, and um, and also not, not be afraid about uh, not putting names in projects as well, you know? Yeah. Sort of, there's a bit of, you know, I've, I, I see that, I've had it over the years, and, and then... You must see it yourself. You have it. In, there's like there's the tear, but then sometimes the stories are so good. But they're even better if like I don't, even I don't think I'm in it. But even if it's, I take myself out, it's, I love watching stories where I'm like I don't care who's in it. I'm just watching a story, you know. And I just think here, you can sometimes you watch a program. It's like I feel like I'm watching the same thing. I'm like, oh no, it's a different program, but it's the same. But the it's same a, actress. A, a it's the same actor. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's just like, oh my god, okay, yeah, you're doing a great job, but was there no one else available you know what I mean and it's on the same channel I get it you're supporting your high end talent but I'm like let's, let's mix it up surely there's there's enough for the door needs to be open <laughs> for, for a bit more yeah. more people you know so Jim we know where you are yeah. now yeah yeah you're here I'm here but I want to go back oh. to growing up <laughs> insert, insert special effect there <laughs> so tell me about growing up in Plasto? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that how you like pronounce it? Say Plasto. Is that how you pronounce it? Pla- I say if you're really from East Land, you say Plasto. You know, but, but if you're on a I'm train... From, Jimmy, I'm from Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But then on the trains you hear, welcome to Plasto sometimes. But yeah, Plasto, born and bred in Plasto, um, in a Plasto hospital that is no longer uh, Plasto hospital. It's, a, it's, I think, got turned into an ambulance place, and now it's some random thing. I don't know what it is. Uh, actually, I don't know if you know a music producer who does all the Pure Garage, like Pure Garage 19, no, Danny no. Donnelly. Anyway, I bumped into him in L.A., and he was born in the same hospital. So I'm like, it's rare that I meet people that were born in Plaster Hospital because he got shut down quite early. So, yeah, I was in e- East London. Where do we start? My Jimmy Bambidele. Ola Tukumbo Akimbola, Nigerian, Yoruba. Uh, my mum and dad came over, I think, in the, um, I would say late 60s, I think, you know, early 70s. Um, from Nigeria. From Nigeria, yeah, yeah from Nigeria. Uh, there's, uh, I've got a brother, eldest brother called Shola. Then I've got a sister uh, called Maruki, but we call her Bumi. Uh, and then I've got another brother who's a few years older than me called Shegan. You all get on. You good, all, good relationships. All good relationships, yes. But uh, my upbringing, I didn't grow up with them. My mum and dad divorced soon after I was born. So were, was, you, were you too young to remember that that bit when they divorced? Were you very, yeah, very, I was were you very, very, very young? young? I was very, very young, yeah. Um, there was issues about basically... Uh, my mum went to Nigeria and apparently my dad was like they would plan every time they would uh, <clears throat> be preparing for a baby uh-huh. and apparently my mum went to Nigeria came back and uh, he didn't remember planning for a baby and I was not you know I was on my way and so they divorced uh, on the basis of some of that and not getting on you know uh, and then so I was with my mum my two brothers my sister went with my dad and then my mum where did where did you t- your your dad uh- he Go. went to West London. He went to right. West London. I think it was in, I think it was in West End, London area. Yeah, and no, and they, yeah, originally we, the family was in West London. Then it went east, broke up. And my dad was in Upton Park, I think, or East Ham area. Did you still manage to maintain a relationship with your dad and your sisters? For the, for my brothers and my sisters, I did. It got better each year as I got older. You know, my dad, I didn't speak to him until I was about sixteen or seventeen. Um, I was in a foster home for a bit. Uh, because oh okay go back because the last thing I heard you were with your mum yeah so what happened there um, if, if, if you yeah, don't no, mind talking no, no. about it we, my, we don't have to discuss no, anything you don't want to no it's my mum uh, my mum uh, suffered uh, from schizophrenia so looking after me and not being well mentally well uh, I was in a foster home until she got better right but 
you know, with that illness, it's a, it's a tough one, mental illness. You have a lot of relapse and stuff like that. Um, and so... Were you I, old enough at the time to be aware of that, that your mum was ill? Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The more... So basically what happened, I got fostered by a foster family. A white foster family in East London, beautiful family, um, that replicated my family, you know? So I had two brothers... Dean was the eldest, then Adam, and a sister called Denise. And uh, they uh, they came to the foster home, not know could have had more kids, you know, uh, and not knowing who they wanted. They saw my beautiful brown eyes and then picked me. And then um, and then uh, I was with them from the age of say two and a half, three, and then for the rest of my life, in terms of each year. I was when my, if my mum was well, my biological mum, yeah, you know, or sometimes I say black mum, white mum, because it gets confusing when I talk to people. Uh, but yeah, my biological mum would come when she was well. She would come and see me at the house in Plasto, and then you know we'd hang out over the weekend, and then she would go back home or might go back to the hospital. Depends where what space she was in. But if she even if she was like on a good patch and she was well, she would go back home, and so. I would have a relationship with my mum a lot. And then sometimes she'd come see me on a Saturday and, you know, there'd be a big bag of fruit, toys. I would see her at the top of the street of, uh, of Jutland Road. I'd be like, yeah, my mum's coming. And there'd always be a gift or something, yeah. you know. Um, and then um, basically that's how I maintain my relationship with my mum. And then as I got older, my siblings, like my older brother Shola, Shaga, I didn't meet, Shola would visit me and uh, I was in contact with my sister, Bumi. But then there was a point, I feel like, that I didn't, you know, I didn't know I had another brother, but I, I feel like I didn't know. So I remember I read a letter, right? My mum, my biological mum's visiting me at my foster home, and then she's, I, I find a letter, and I thought I, I, I'd written it, because it's asking for, like, a Game Boy and all these things. And I'm like, I don't remember writing this. And then it's something about malaria, Nigeria. I'm like, well, what's this? And then my mum in an African way, ah, oh, that's your brother. I was just like, huh? I've got another brother? I, I don't know. Honestly, I just remember it. And then, basically, growing up with a white foster family in East London, interacting on and off with my eldest brother, Shola, and my sister, uh, that was the rhythm of my upbringing, you know? So I sort of had a working-class East End upbringing. Occasionally, though, when my mum would see me or via my other Nigerian friends, that's where I would get, like, my my West African influence, you know. Uh, but I remember a day I went to Ravens, Ravenscroft School and uh, before going to secondary school, Cumberland, which is down the road, uh, uh, in the building that actually was used to be Trinity that he just went to, sorry, yeah. uh, which is just, just a funny link because I just recently worked with him. Um, I were, Anyway, before I went to secondary school, I was in my final year juniors and, the, and then when I was in the third year, I was in the fourth year group, okay? And this one boy called Ricky, he, uh, he left in his fourth year to go to secondary school. But he went to Brampton, Brampton Manor, which is about 10, 15 minutes down the other way. And then I saw him one summer holiday and he's like, Jimmy, oh, Jimmy. He's on the old school 15 buses, you know, you know, with the yeah. doors. He's like, Jimmy. I'm like, what? And he's pointing to this sort of black figure with specs and glasses. This is your brother. You know, and, and then the bus is pulling away. And at that point, you know, obviously I knew I had another brother a couple of years older than me, but I, we'd never met. No. And I remember, I didn't know what to do, the emotion, man. I was like, what? What was that? Ah. I, I, I just run home to my foster mom, Gloria. I was like, mom, she's like, what, what? Ah, 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 I just saw my brother. Honestly, it was a crazy moment. Crazy Your moment. Your head must have been spinning, spinning out. Spinning. And then the next year I went to secondary school. No, and that, via that year, when I would see the same people that I was in the class with when I was a third year in a junior school, they're already in senior school, they're coming back to my area going, oh, I've met your brother, he looks like you. Got the same nose, lips. Yeah, 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 shake and and bola. I know him, he's your brother. I'm just like, oh my God, it was weird. Like, all these people at school with my brother. But I remember the social services was like, my dad didn't want anything to do with me, and so me and him couldn't connect. Um... But, uh, I mean, it's a big, long story. But to shorten it a bit, eventually, Shola, my oldest brother, uh, he connected me and my middle brother, Shegan. 
at his house. He was living in Borough at the time. Right. And I went there and he was just there. And you know when you just think it's going to be an issue? And it was no issue. It was just like, oh, you're right, mate. You're right. And then we, we were tight. We were and tight. It was very, since. very natural. Seriously, so natural. And, uh, you know, <laughs> the first night we had out together, you know, uh, me and my brother, my brother gave us five pounds each, Shola. And then we went out to Trocadero on the arcades and spent it all on Street Fighter and then got arrested <laughs> that same night for nicking like orange juice and some buns outside of some bakery, Ugh. you know? But we, we just were just hungry because we spent all our money. But actually for months, somebody had been stealing stuff and they saw me and my brother and a couple of other guys. you got the blame for all that. Blame for it. <laughs> so yeah, and that was the first time we came together and it was all like, oh my God, <laughs> oh, these brothers, what, how, how are they going to be? But... It's interesting because the the um, the core where you were when you were settled with the the Foster family mm. sounded solid, it, and, and you were settled. And then around this was your biological family. It's very frenetic mm-hmm. and, and chaotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How was that hard to process for you? No, I would say my Foster family, like my, you know, it's again just because it gets confusing. They're amazing. You know what they taught me? The capacity of unconditional love, right? You know, you got a woman, Gloria. She already had two boys, Adam and Dean. Then she met Dennis, my, my, my foster dad. Then they had a third baby, my sister, Denise. So at that point, they could have had another baby. And then they have the capacity go to go, oh, there are kids in a foster home that, that could, you know, why don't we just help them? And then... In those days, in the, you know, <clears throat> I don't want to give away my age, but, you know, <clears throat> you know, of course, I, I'm, I know, I won't I'm, tell I'm a 2000 baby, obviously. <laughs> but in those days, to, to have, I know, the love, the courage to go, I'm going to pick this, this beautiful black baby and, and bring him home with me. And I'm, I'm going to push that pram down the Barking Road with the three other children around me as is mine. I'm just yeah. like, like... I've asked them recently, just Christmas. I was like, I had to ask them. I was like, did you not ever, was it never an issue? They're like, what are you talking about? No, son, just loved you. I'm like, no, but it's a big deal. They're like, why is it a big deal? I'm like, wow, they're, they're different. Do you know what I mean? And, um, and so unconditional love, but also they were grounded. Do you know what I mean? They were, they were settled. I had a, a settled upbringing. Uh, I, had a, I was just, I was never the foster boy. You know what I mean? I was like the brother. You know yeah. what I mean? I get beats when I'm too Larry because I'm the youngest and I wind everybody up. Me and my sister used to fight like cats and dogs. But if anybody tried to touch me at school, she would just <laughs> beat them up big time. Do you know what I mean? How was uh, school, Jimmy? School was... Did you get on with it? Did you get on with the system? I, I did. I did. I, 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 had, I had so much fun. I was a cheeky, chappy, just lots of fun. I probably could have studied a bit more. But I was always... Everybody says that. You know that, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like a youth centre for yeah. me. Uh, so I loved it. And I was very... Uh, I was into my sports, uh, infants, junior school time and the secondary school. Um, you know, I wasn't really... I didn't... A couple of times in detention. I was the type of guy that was... My older brother, my foster brother, Dean, was very much into martial arts. And that's how I got into it a bit. And he would always have like a nunchuck in the house or a flick knife. So I'm the type of guy, like, I'm like... What was it? nine or ten junior school I'm like my brother's gone to work at 6am to work in pass or force or whatever I nick the knife I take it to school and I'm like flip flip because I know I had to do it because you know my brother showed me I'm like look at this knife guys everyone's like oh Jimmy man look at Jimmy's knife cut to like yeah I'm in the dinner hall and something falls out of my pocket Ching! <laughs> and Ooh. it opens perfectly with the blade out get called to the office and that's the sort of things I would do I, stupid things like that and then not learn from that and then do the same thing with nunchuckers you know you know so <laughs> it could have been worse imagine if, if you were a kid nowadays at school and that yes. drops out your yeah, no, you, you know what I mean it's true actually this, yeah it's that's, a different place see how much that's changed that's changed yeah I got a little slap on the wrist and you know I was home for a couple of days because they obviously knew that you were just showing off yeah you know yeah, what I mean yeah. there was no, there was no intent. intent no no intent with it but, you know, um, when we were at school, there was very rarely that yeah. type of awful stuff that's, that's so relevant and sadly happening today. I know. I, I feel like the, it was the war, majority of the time it was fists. You know what I mean? There might be sticks, and bats and stuff. You know what I mean? But it was majority, it was a fist up. Like in but school. it would never escalate to what it does no, now. No, no, no. It really, it really didn't, you know, back then, you know. And so... 
Yeah, my school was cool, man. And uh, and I was in that funny place. I wasn't the uber cool kid. I wasn't the nerd. I was always, I've always I was the floater. So I could roll with the calls, the nerds, like, and I loved that. I never liked people telling me who I could be friends with. Do you know what I mean? I used to yeah. love it when, like, the caller, why are you talking to that guy? And I'm like, shut up. I'm going to go and talk to them. And then also, why well, I love my family, you know, there weren't no gangsters or whatever, but, like, my brothers were big guys. Do you know what I mean? So no one would mess with them. So even though I was, there wasn't that many black people around, sort of, Plasto edging into Cannon Town around there, but, like, I was known as Gloria's boy or Dean and Adam's brother, but then also it was a time where you do had to mark out your territory. So, you know, you would always know who's the best fighter in the third year, fourth yeah. year. And so when I, you know, I'd, there was times I had to mark that out and it sometimes be racism, you know? If anyone would say anything about my race or my mum, that's it, we'll go to blows. And I remember that happened in Ravenscross School, juniors. Uh, Stephen Nyland, he was a year older than me as well and I just... You know, went at him, went at him. You, you, know? Know, you always remember the four names, don't you? And you can't pronounce just it was. You have to give the full, full name, name of those people because yeah. he came out. He was over yeah. football as well because I'm a big footballer. He was over football. And he was trying it. And he was on me and on me. And I was just like, I've got to do this. And we just went at it. And then then that it's so funny. Like it's not ego, but I could just feel the respect for the rest of the school. And I remember that feeling. And I just remembered. I know I'm going to have to do that every now and then, especially when I go to secondary school. But also, I remember doing it for friends. I remember I had a friend called Kieran Sud. We went into Cannon Town, which is like literally five, ten minutes across the up the road. Yeah. And you're in a different territory. It's like proper Cannon Town, custom ass, Danny Dyer territory. It's like you go there, and if you're if you're if you're a bit darker than white, you've got to know someone. And I remember they were trying to rob my Indian friends and my Pakistani friends, and I just had to like back them you know what I mean this yeah. one guy Andrew Lowe we didn't come to blows we became friends in the end but it was for me me stepping forward to stop that from happening you know what I mean so when I went to Cumberland a couple of times that would happen and I would step in and then also I just I would never look for fights but I would relish if someone older would try it, try it with me do you know what I mean because yeah. I was like you know I'm not, it's not going to happen and another one, Wayne Hawks. I remember him. He, so he was two years older than me. Good name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I was doing some karate in my shots at the time. And I got him, got him good. And then my sister came along. I battered him. Like, <laughs> my sister just got a strong right hook. She battered him. I was like, don't want your shot going, oh my God, you know? Um, but yeah, so for me, school, I love it. It was full of sports, playing football. Lots of fun and games. I didn't know I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a footballer. I was playing... Well, football was a big main focus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought my uncle had a... My foster uncle, Mick, uh, Michael Beckwith, used to show me Kenny Douglas videos, Liverpool videos, you know? So I'm a Liverpool fan, as you can tell from my accent. <laughs> Scouser. But I love the way they played. And then you had John Barnes. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the power of imagery, which connects to why I'm an actor as well, right? So when you're seeing someone like John Barnes and, you know, I was sort of aware of the racism in them times, you know, Cyril Regis. And you're seeing this guy, one of the best teams in the world, and you've got this guy that's kicking it up on the wing. I was just like, of course I'm going to be sporting Liverpool for the rest of my life. And then he, my uncle would be like, pass and move, pass and move. And so once I started playing football, I was like, this is what I want to do. But I started late, you know, but I was good at it. But then I realized I was behind the curve. Okay, even then you needed to be on a professional box like by the age of like 10, 11 and yeah. I was like hitting my 14s and just sort of getting into and it and I know very little about football oh, at all. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not sport at all but even I would know if someone's really good that's great at football but they've got to be on another yeah. level they've yeah. got to have something really special about yeah. them and, yeah. and I can tell when I say it, I watch very, don't watch that much but I can, yeah. you can see it can't you yeah. you can name you the can. special players you can the ones that are just the top shelf yeah um, but I it was quite interesting as I got older the Ian Wright story again imagery you know being inspired yeah you know just hearing his story of you know sort of getting into his sort of late 20s I'm like playing non-league and I was like well look if I don't get it like now like between 14 and 16 and get the YTS scheme or whatever it was back then you know what I mean then then I'm gonna do the Ian Wright way you know and then um, just to cut back at Cumberland School I had a teach called Mr. Tyres and he used to he knew my foster family my sister and my brothers he taught them in Cumberland School before me right so he's like oh you're the, you're the youngest of the family right? yeah and he used to take me out of maths with Mr. Hall to help him out in drama 
And I'd be like, I hated maths anyway. I hated yeah. it. I'd always cheat, get the, the, they used to get the, you got the answers and then you got the questions and the answers on the back of the forms. I'd always be like, no, I'm, like, I'm just going to copy the answers. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? I'm like, forget about that. And so when he started taking me out, I didn't think nothing of it, but I'd be a first or a second year helping third, fourth or fifth years with their drama. You know, I'd be like, oh, whatever, whatever. At least I get out of maths. And then um, he'd be suggesting me to go and do like workshops and my six weeks holidays, which is like gold dust, right? Six weeks yeah. to roam the streets, go away, whatever. Suddenly, I'd, sometimes I would find myself, I'm doing some plays with uh, other kids doing drama and some, some kids of, with disabilities and stuff like that and enjoying it. But like in hindsight, I'm like, how did he get me to do all that stuff? Rather than, you know, you've got, that's when summers were summers as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? I and like, they lasted. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And this course would go over for four weeks. I'm like, he got me doing that stuff. But I didn't want to be an actor. Pardon me, he passed when I was in my third year. It was a big loss. And uh, I remember from my fifth year drama play, it was the first time I had come up with an idea. My friends always laugh about it. Some of these girls I used to sort of drama with. And I watched Pryor. I used to watch Pryor with my foster mum. And it, there, was, there was a Pryor episode where sort of the play reflected life. And I was like, oh, I've got a great idea. And I sort of you know, got inspired by that, used the story of Othello. So I was very aware of my race growing up, you know? Not to hold me back, but I was very aware of it. Yeah. You know, and so I was like, let's do Othello. I'm the actor playing Othello, but in the real life, you know, we're going out, you know, you're a white girl, I'm a black guy. And just how, and I just, how the, the art started reflecting life. Do you know what I mean? And it just got, I got a bit jealous with her and another co-star friend of mine. And then I ended up <laughs> killing her like Othello does. But we got an A for it, you know? Wow. Still didn't want to be an actor. I was going to be a footballer. Um, still. Still. <laughs> still. I wanted it. And I, there's something in me, I think... From a foster family in East London, there's something, being from Newham, one of the poorest boroughs in London, there's an expectation that you can't succeed and do stuff. And I, and I think I, my mum was always, I don't know, yeah, my mum, Gloria, is always, you know, go for it, go for anything. Never have regrets, you know, yeah. try that. Uh, my dad would be like, oh, he's just did karate, why does he want to do judo? Well, she's like, oh, let him do his thing. She and sounds then, like she was very supportive of you to very, do whatever you wanted very, to do. Very, yeah, very. And so... And then, you know, I think there is culture, you know, I feel like Blackpool, North, the East, there's the gift of the gap. So when I left secondary school, <laughs> I had an A in drama. I'm not going to tell you what I got for the rest of my rules. I was like, <laughs> and I turned out at Epping Forest College. I decided not to go to New Vic, which was my local uh, college or anyone's closer to me because I realized that I've had fun in school, but I'm having too much fun. You know what yeah. I mean? I was a bit like, let me, let me. Again, I don't know what I'm thinking. Like, let me stretch myself. Let me go meet new people, and let me get be in a place where I can concentrate a bit more. You know, and then I can hang out with my mates when I get back into my area. So I go to Epping Forest College. Danny Levy recommended it to me. He's a friend of my brother's, uh, Adam, my brother. Yeah, you know, and and the link there, Danny Levy, my brother Adam Kelly, because he had the name of his dad, not my foster dad Dennis, his surname Crow. They went to school with Gary Charles. So I'm again my football night. Gary Charles <laughs> played for Nottingham Forest in England, and he was the guy Gazza tried to foul and Gazza had the big injury. So anyway, Danny Levy said you should. He's trying to be an actor. And he said you should come to Epping. I go to Epping. I you know look at all the courses and I'm sat across the table with the principal and she's like, look, you're good, um, but I think if you do the BTEC first, first, and then you do the national, I'm like, what? That's three years. She's like, yes, yes, because you don't have the grades. I was like. Nah, no, see what it is. I can't do that, love. She's like, we, we, no, but you don't have the grades. I was like, I tell you what, I'm better than that. You know, and I'm not, I wasn't a big head, but I just knew, like, I didn't even know I wanted to be an actor. I was just doing a course to keep myself busy while yeah. I become Ian Wright, right? Yeah. Even though I'm a Liverpool fan. <laughs> so I'm like, look, this is, I tell you what I do. She's looking at me like, what's this kid doing? I was like, let me do the BTEC National Diploma, all right? And because I'm better than, the, it'd be a waste of a year doing the BTEC first. And, uh, and she's, she's like, but you don't have the grades. I was like, well, look, what else can I do to make that happen? She's like, okay, what if you retake your English and at the same time you do the BTEC National Diploma? I was like, deal, done. Yeah, fast, and I was fast. in, and I was in, you know? I was like, great, got in. I, I just knew, I was like, because like you know who the strong people in your drama cast and who are not. All that coming out of maths with my drama teacher, I sort of knew what I was capable of, but I didn't want to be an actor. Still. So what happened was that I did that, still trying to be an actor, started playing for Newham District, which is like, like the best players in your borough of Newham, you know? And when I got picked, I was like, I'm playing for Newham, man. 
You know, I'm like, this is a big deal. Like, from there, a lot of players were already on, like, books with West Ham or Wimbledon and stuff like that. Mate, when my first game, I realised I was so far off the pace. Like, like, kids my same age, so much stronger and faster. Like, I remember a tackle, this guy Campbell from Langdon, he tackled me once. It was like my whole body broke. Seriously, it was like my whole body broke. I was just like... What is going on here? And then it affected my speed, my touch for the rest of the half. Yeah. I got brought off at half time. And then like that was a eye opener of like, I've got to get stronger, I've got to work harder, you know, but I still wasn't gonna give up. Anyway, back to Epic Forest College. I wanted to be an act uh, I wanted to be a footballer, not an actor. But the first week once I got in, they would the assignment was to write a monologue, fact or fiction, and perform it in front of the first years and the second years that were there. Yeah, I was a B Tech National Diploma. I was very shy. I was very shy as a kid. You talk to me, I'd be like, Shh. you'd be like, sorry, mate. I'd be like, yeah, my name's Jimmy. I don't know what, I was very shy. But if you got, if I was performing or something, doing some poetry when I was in the infants or juniors, I sort of come alive. But in my everyday, I was very shy. And so when I did this sort of monologue, I wrote about this time when me and my uh, biological brother, Shegan, got arrested. And I just elaborated. I elaborated how we got arrested. I elaborated that the, when my dad came, it wasn't my foster white dad. It was my Nigerian dad that I don't, e- I don't even know. I've not even met him. Yeah. But because of people like Gina Yashere, Eddie Murphy, Real McCoy, and all these you know, comedians and stuff I watched on telly, you know, you know, train planes and automobiles. I was like, I just got creative with it. You know, so I played the African dad. I played myself like the, the street rude boy listening to Junglist. And <laughs> it was great. And I got a standing ovation, all right? And in that moment, I'm not lying, Craig, it was like, I want to ask you actually what your moment was for becoming an actor. But that moment, I did the speech just because I was told I had to. I'm like, God, it's going to be a hard two years just to get through this because they're making me write stuff, right? You know. Yeah. But I did this performance, standing ovation, and then it was like an arrow into my chest. I was like, oh my God, I am buzzing. I just create, (laughs) think mic drop, like, you know what I mean? For the rest of my life, I was like, I'm buzzing. Like, in a better way than I, than I do when I score a goal. You know, uh, they're all standing. I created these characters. I love the laughter. I'm going to be an actor. It's I infectious. Was, I was 16. I wow. was 16. I was like, all right, I'm doing this. I'm going to leave this college in two years. I'm going to go to drama school because I've seen these newspapers called The Stage and all the drama schools in the back, and I'm going to become an actor. And... Here I am talking to you now. I did the football thing Peter away, or did you still... I kept it up. Yeah. Uh, when I went to Aura Drama School, I got into Aura when I was you know, still a pup. I was like, wasn't even 18. And then um, I kept playing football in the middle of the week. I started playing for Clacton. Uh, again, a semi-pro team. And I was like, I can still do this. But then I fell out of love of it because I think the organisation of the... The semi-pro club was a bit up and down. Uh, I remember getting put from striker right midfield to right back, but I was quite good at it. Uh, I think that happened with Ashley Cole as well. And then I remember it was hard for me to go to drama school, do nine till six, get on the train from Tooting Beck all the way back to East London for a skate and then train you know what I mean? For yeah. three, I, it was too much. And priorities change when, it, you're, it just, when you're training. You know, you just, just, and you don't have any time to do anything else, let alone try and get a part-time job to fund yourself, yeah. you know? Well, if you want to talk about that, you know, probably my first year drama school, I dropped out of playing football. I just said, I'm not doing it. But just because I, the love of the acting was so big, I turned into a festival. I was like, ah, oh, to get up on a Sunday. <laughs> In the cold rain, it just didn't appeal to me. But no. like, reading plays and you know I mean watching films and TV it's not funny that it all changed shifted, quite quickly shifted I can't believe even now I can't believe it because I've turned into Alan Hansen I just talk about it like oh yeah I could have been you know and I, I can talk football all day but back to what you were saying because the funny thing is really interesting because when we was at the working heroes yeah uh, I got a grant to go to Aura so you probably would have been in one of the last years. Last years, to get yeah, one. yeah, the last one or two years. I got a grant, and I remember what happened. Uh, I uh, I got the letter before I went on my first trip out of the country. I went to South Africa on a youth exchange with Paul Leslie, a uh, uh, CBS youth project, which was based in Cannon Town. And even there, I got offered it. He offered it for me for like fifty quid. I was like, nah, nah, nah. I don't want to. 
I don't want to do it. And then plus I've got drama school coming up. Went home to my mum, Gloria, my foster mum. She's like, what are you talking about? That's a trip of a lifetime. I was like, I ain't got the money. She said, I'll give you the money. Call him right now. And I went to South Africa. And then I remember writing to Alra saying, look, I can't afford this. So I'm going to come and audition for the scholarship. They're like, okay. And I'm thinking, I've got in, but how am I going to go? How am I going to go to drama school if I don't get the scholarship? Yeah. So before I went on the plane, I wrote out a form to my borough of Newham going, look, my name's Jimmy Akambola. I'm probably one of two, if not three people that's probably got into drama school from the borough of Newham. You know, I've got my own flat in, in Canning Town because when you leave care uh, at the age of 16, 17, you know, I was brought up right. You either get two grand or you get a flat. <laughs> I was like... No brainer. I was like, I look stupid. <laughs> so I took the flat, you know what I mean? So I was like, I've got my flat. And then also, you know, working class family, I wasn't scared to work. So I was ushering at Theatre Royal Stratford East. Yeah. So I was able to watch plays and get that theatre education, seeing all the great talent there. Philip Headley was a artistic director. You know, I learned about Joan Littlewood and saw some great actors. So I was putting all that in the form. Do you know in that bit where it says, if you've got any more information? I just went on even more. I was like, look, I've done all this. I've done this. I've done that. And then I went on to this youth exchange, which blew my mind because I feel like, again working class areas is sort of like you feel like that's everything and you, like, it's that one experience when you come out of your area and let alone out of your country yeah. two years after apartheid as well I'm sat in like you know Joburg and in the office where Mandela sits to delegate I was just like this is mind blowing but then I'm speaking to kids about education and seeing how they value education and then my guilty self is like oh I, I, you know I was just taking it for a joke I yeah. didn't really care yeah. and they're like no it's everything for us and then us going yeah but if you don't get a job in it you can just sign on they're like uh, what do you mean What's sign that? on yeah, you yeah, know like all these little nuggets at the age of 17 I was like oh my god it was a puts it was things a, into perspective it, it really did it really did and then I learnt my uh, Malvolio speech sorry I keep hitting the mic it's all right, I'm, like, don't worry, I'm getting a bit aggressive <laughs> like, oh. uh, I learnt my Malvolio speech uh, when I was in South Africa was this for the scholarship or for the scholarship one? yeah came back did that thought I did it really well you know doing things you don't know what you're doing I'm doing this sort of stuff and the guy Leon Eagles he's like okay that was good he's like um, what was you doing with that was you holding you know Malvolio's cloak and stuff I was like yeah 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 yeah. well done <laughs> no, d- I thought that was gonna I thought that had gone over people's heads but you got it well done to you <laughs> I like a bit of improvisation. I believe in accidental improvisation. Sometimes they're the best scenes we've ever done on screen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, what, what's that thing you did, Jim? You're like, oh, well, no, I messed that up. That was a big fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tried to style it out. So it felt good. And I was waiting to hear about that. And then, lo and behold, I got the letter from Newham saying, hey, you've got a grant. Um, which was amazing. But also, again, Craig, I was just learning, man. I didn't know. I was living my own and I was getting support a little bit for the social services for the first two years but I had this grant checks I had about three or four still in my drawer and so I went into the it got to the end of the first year of my first year and I'm like um guys uh when are you going to take the money for the course because I've got all these checks here and I've not paid you yet they're like on the computer um Jimmy what are you talking about um, you have paid your, your fees have been paid I was like well what's this then they're like that's your maintenance so not only I didn't know she got maintenance as well mate I got maintenance as well I didn't know because I only asked for fees but maybe because of my big sort of true but a bit sob story I give him maintenance as well so after that when I bought some Nikes big leather jacket no no no, no, I didn't I was really good actually I just banked it and um Realised how fortunate I was. I'm incredibly lucky. Yeah. Because yeah. we know, I mean, we heard a few weeks ago of all those Mate. amazingly talented individuals yeah. who were finding it really hard and struggling to even get the foot in the door, having been accepted yeah. to, to, to be educated and do what they love and what yeah. they want to do. Yeah, mate, yeah. And I still worked, though. I worked uh, Theatre Royal Stratford East until it... Until I left college. Another you know? bit of education. Yeah. It's free educa- You're getting paid to be educated there. Amazing. Exactly. And, but also learning about the graft of like, oh, just because i got the money, I don't have to do that. It was like, because I, I was seeing, studying with students that were leaving at six to go and work in the bar yeah. till like 10, 11 at night. And I'm like, how are you going to learn all that work we've got to do? You know what I'm saying? And I would, I would do sort of three, four nights a week ushering. And, um, and it, uh, for me, it really... The work ethic kicked in there. My first year of drama school, I had to. I realised I'd been coasting on my cheeky chappy, little bit of talent, but was a bit lazy. 
and expected, you know, it to be given to me, you know? Yeah. And then you get to drama school, these people have been doing this stuff since they were four, and they're talking about, you know, <laughs> they're talking about certain words, they're like, I, like, I don't even yeah. know what that means. Yeah, you got I'm to growing up as a kid. It's, 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 I don't know, I wouldn't say embarrassing, but it's exposing, isn't it? And it is embarrassing sometimes. When you That's exactly people, the right word, it is exposing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I don't you, know, and you do feel embarrassed if you are exposed, don't you see? Then you go, right, I'm going to have to pull out all the stops here. But it's like anything, it's like when we're working, you yeah. go, if you, if you don't come in or you don't know this, yeah. And then yeah, it, you're going to be revealed you're a bloody charlatan. I know. And I we know. feel like that at the best of times anyway. I know, I know. Because exactly. of our self-esteem gets broken. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. I call it the acting please, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's like you get the job and you just, you know, you just get the rap just before they turn up. Yeah, and so you're like, right. You're no, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, exposed. And, and also, because I was young, I think... I was young, I was, yeah, I was the youngest in the school, uh, and so I was still growing up, you know, there's the way I spoke, a little bit more, it wasn't, it was, I don't know, just, I just spoke normal to me, but they were picking up on my, the little bit, the Cockneyisms and my little streetisms, and even some of the Afghanisms, where I'm like, well, I didn't grow up in my African family, but do you know the influences But it's that still part of still you. still part of you, yeah. yeah. And, but then when you're 17, it's like, what are you talking about telling me I can't talk? Yeah. Shut up, you know what I mean? And you're telling me I can't walk. Just because I gave Uncle Vanya a little bit of a bowl. You know, you, do, you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Just because I gave him a like, yeah, yeah. I was like, come on, man, give him a bit of culture. I would like to have sent that Uncle Vanya. <laughs> We're going to have to do it. One man, Jimmy, Uncle Vanya. Let's put, think, sort this out. I think I might do the one man show. But I found it, I did find, I found the first year tough, Craig. Seriously. Did yeah. I did, mate. I, I went home crying to my mum, my, 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 my first one, Gloria, and she, Again, solid. Like, oh, and my, and my biological mom, strong women in my life, they do inspire me. Their strength, you know, because of what, what my biological mom's been through with the mental health and the divorce and, and whatnot. But then also what my, my foster mom, Gloria, like, she's, she's the strength of the family. She holds us together and, you know, she's been through some stuff as well and, and just been there for us and just solid and... Uh, Still, though, I used to go and bawling to her, crying, and then she'd be like, look, you can do this. You know what I mean? Give me the hugs and kisses, and uh, i walk home to my flat, because by that time, I wasn't at home. I was 10 minutes up the road. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm leaving home. <laughs> walk next door, you What's know? What's for tea? Yeah. <laughs> I'll All be around in five minutes. All that tea. Can I bring my washing? Yeah. But it was really nice to to go home. So, like you, uh, where did you go to drama school? In Mount View in North London. So, look, for you, I don't know what age you were, but what I realised when I was going through that, crying my eyes out at 17, 18, is that if I was from Blackpool, Leeds or Manchester, living in London, getting my ass chewed up by a different acting teachers and coaches and being pulled apart saying everything's wrong with you. Let's, not, f- let's fix this. Where do you go for a bit of love and a bit of like, oh, I need some, I need some buffering up? Because that's a long train to go back to Blackpool. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I was like, Jim, man, you have to count yourself lucky that you can go home to your mum. And then I just realised I wasn't working enough. You know, that thing where they like, over the four weeks, work on these sheets. I want to look at those sheets. And as soon as I started doing that, you know, the main thing I think was with like, they were so obsessed. Again, I'd be interested in your thing about this, about RP. Do you know what I mean? And I was just like, oh man. And so once I started working at it, I got better. You know what I mean? And and then they, I get rounds of applause. But then I didn't like that. I was like, what are you trying? To, you know, monkey. I was like, why are you giving me a round of applause? <laughs> I know, but it's weird because if you're the only, I was the only. There was only two black guys there. There was only two. Caroline Chikenzi was in it. She used to be in. Um, yeah, I yeah. You know, yeah, of course. She was, yeah, yeah. She, was, she, was, she was a year above me, so there wasn't that many people of color. And then you say, like, "Why are you all clapping me?" Do you know what I mean? So you all think I am crap as well. You know what I mean? So you're tight and you're not doing the work, and also you're always being pointed out that you're out of thirty people, you're the only one that can't do this speech or or say it properly, and you know. And so it tested me, man. I I was so confident, and by the end of my first year, I was rock bottom. But then when I started putting in the work, and again, the work ethic, and seeing the change in myself and seeing the tutors respond to me in a different way, then I never looked back. Do you know what I mean? I, and did that turn around when you went back for second year? Did you, you have a different mindset? It did. And because once I started seeing them, like, if you were my tutor, respond to me, that changed me completely. And then also Gay Brown, the actress, 
she uh, it was in the hockey horror show. Horror show. She um, she came and directed me in uh, ah, Doctor Stockman. What's that? Enemy of the People. Yeah. And she just uh, somehow she just gave me my confidence back. Do you know what I mean? I think she could see where it was, and so much so that do you know when you do the rehearsal and you smash it, Craig? You're like, yeah. You know what I mean? No, <laughs> I, to- I never feel like that. You know, I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I'd love to, but I always go. No, I'm just. This is awful. <laughs> <laughs> don't, mate. Don't, don't stop it. You but must never go on. My analogy is is like, you know, you you're like a kid that <laughs> you came too quick. <laughs> I spilt the beans, so the rehearsal was great. The actual performance. <laughs> Was it? Yeah, because I was like, yeah, I, like I went all out, knew, thought I had it all. Then the next performance, I, it just was terrible. Yeah. But it was the best le- <laughs> learning curve ever. It is a, it's you know a, I mean? a brilliant thing. Yeah, but you're right. You're right. It's a great analogy. Cause yeah, it's, it's very, very true. And she told me she, was like, <laughs> she told me I was terrible, but she said the, the performance before was brilliant. And she just, do you know, like managers. I know, I know you're not a football man, but like she's very. If you get a good director, there's a way. Some directors are not actors' directors, and they're just about the visual. And if you can, I feel like if I can get a director or a person that can really sort of connect with me and tap into me, then that brings out the best. And she did that. That was, I think, she was the first time that I'd worked with a director that could really see my potential and yeah. work with me in, in that collaborative. And, and to draw it out draw of you. Out, yeah. And so, just going through that process with her, I was back, Craig. But now I was back with two years of training. And then suddenly, you know, I got an agent, signed with Adrian King. I got onto the BBC World Service. You know, I didn't win it, but I was the runner up, but I preferred that because it allowed me to go off and do theater. And then suddenly I was just on a momentum. Yeah. And literally I felt like Leicester City in terms of bottom of the league. And by the time I left drama school, like, you know, I was the one that was working, had an agent and I have not stopped since. And, you know, it's nice. Sometimes you get the perspectives and, Got my mug on the front going, look, this is an actor that works sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, I'm blessed, you know? Um, Jimmy, so, I want to talk about... Sorry, was I cutting you no, off? No, 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 it's so good, so good. I want to talk about, for people who don't know, about uh, Triforce and how, how, where and how did all that start and why did it start? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I wish I got that question at the... <laughs> Working class heroes. You were slipping event. in enough, mate. You did enough mentions. I thought someone was going to uh, pick up on it, mate. You know why I was doing it though? Before I answer that question, is because I loved it, and you know, uh, Dane's doing a great thing. But I just felt the event. They were talking about the problem a lot, and I saw a lot of young uh, actors and actresses out there that reminded me of the young me. And I remember there was an actor that he was going through a bad time, and he just sort of tried to. Uh, stamp on my dream and crush my dream I just felt like it was in danger of crushing people's dreams because it was so negative because I'm like yes talk about the problem but then can we look at the, some of the solutions so if I'm sat there as an actor there's no point me to I don't want to talk about my acting career solely I would do it a bit but I'm there as a co-founder of an organisation that's actually helping actors get Exactly. Work, representation yeah. you know what I mean it is inclusive class race we've got 12 year olds to 72 year olds it's like we're doing all that but you're not allowing me to you know you've got too many on the panel and you're not allowing me to sort of talk about that and it's I mean there should have been a whole debate just on that or a whole talk just on that just as there should have been a whole thing about Stephen and diversity school because sometimes people I I said to people oh do you know about this no I've never heard about it yeah I know I know I know oh well why have you not heard about (laughs) this why have you not heard about Triforce yeah 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 and there was no programs even even like a little one sheet of paper of just people's names and the websites but I think the thing is Jimmy it what the, the amazing thing that Danny has done, and he, I know he worked so hard doing yeah. it, was to bring things to light. And, I, and you know, I've spoke to him since, and it is just the start. Yeah. And everything has to start somewhere. True. And I think it's one of the most positive things I've been to. N- and the only thing that I, that I was not annoyed about, but disappointed about, which we couldn't have done, it was impossible, that we could have gone on at yeah. least twice yeah, yeah. as long yeah. and we could have spoken to every single person in that audience because there were still 34 people with their hands up. But yeah. it was a, he, that was a jam-packed day. Yeah. I mean... Yeah, no, it was jam-packed, you're right. And I, 
and I, I love the fact that he I, I should actually I wanted to meet up with him before I went to LA but you know I would love to I'm going to try and call him and whatnot because it is what he's done is great and I can see how he's like let's just start it off and get everyone there do you know because it almost it was like it took a half hour to get down the other end of the panel I know, but, but there's but that I, thing where you've got to bring everybody together at first yeah. to get the ball rolling but also you know? nobody else is doing that and inviting people and going you come down here for less than a pint yeah 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 and we can discuss something yeah, yeah, and yeah. try and move things forward yeah 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 and I think you know we started in London I think it, it's going to go further afield because yeah. obviously no I there's, there's there's people up in Nottingham in Manchester in Birmingham in Scotland yeah you know. it's got to go there far and wide yeah but yeah and we're going to be talking to I'm going to be talking to him and BFI and um but back to your question why did it start I suppose and how and yeah. how so how it started Actually, and, and sort of for people who don't know, what what is it? Do you know what I mean? Because the people, yeah, as as with everything, there might be people yeah. who don't know what it is. And yeah, yeah. I think you know what it is is fantastic. You know, I'm a big fan. So. No, no, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, Trifles Creative Network. Uh, at first, we named it as uh, Trifles Promotions, um, and before the, the the starting thing was is that we were doing a play in Edinburgh. Me and Fraser Ayres in like 2002 or three, yeah, three, called People Next Door. And um, he got an award for it. It's an amazing play uh, written by Henry Adams. And I was in it with him, playing a 16-year-old when I was in my early 20s. I was like, I don't know how I was getting away with that. Um, but it was a hit, and we are having a great time. Roxanne Silbert directed it. And then there was something we, we kept doing. Uh, it's a carnival vibe anyway in Edinburgh, isn't it? You know yeah. what I mean? Everyone's out there together, drinking, party. It's great. But somehow, Craig, me and Fraser would galvanize everybody, like the lighting guy, the bar person's got his off day, some of the other cast doing other plays. And, and we would say, you know, Roxanne would join us, the cast and directors, come over to, I didn't know what the name of the club was, but it was like five minutes on, is it Lothian Road? Be a pound of pint, pound of pop, yeah. alcoholic drink. And we'll get like almost like 30 to 50 people like in the club dancing with us and interacting in a way that they might not really interact even within the theatre because they're in different sort of areas of the building. That, that's the tech guy, you know? Yeah. And on the professional level, of course, we're tech, but I stay with my people. And, we'd, and then we'd get people from other theatres, other shows, and it would get bigger from 30, 50, 60, 70. And it was just like, it was just really lovely. And it was just like, it was fun. It was drinks, partying, but there was this thing that we noticed what was connecting, right? It was connecting, and, uh, and we was, like, connecting and empowering. Because if someone didn't know something or, oh, you know, like, you could be a, a young writer, but suddenly you're talking to the writer of the hit show of Edinburgh Festival, and he's giving you some few pointers. You know what I mean? Or you're, you're an actor, and you're like, oh, there's Roxanne Silbert having, having a Jack D and Coke on me. Let, let me go and tap to her, you know? And then... Um, we said to ourselves, it's a shame that this is only just for Edinburgh Festival, isn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if we could, you know, harness this and have it in London all the time? And then when we got back to London, we started talking a bit more about it. Going like, like how, what could we do? How could we, how could we do something? And then Fraser had a birthday at the Rex Cinema and Bar. And then after what we did, I actually... I think Facebook was new around about the time. I think he just did a invite, public invite to our friends in the industry and friends of friends. I was finishing a play at Soho Theatre, so I brought my cast and the director. Jeremy Zimmerman came, you know, and he had some casting associates with him. And we, we, we went to this sort of screening club thing that was a part of Planet Hollywood, and we just turned up. We just had a really great time. But the, the mixture of people was so diverse and yeah. inclusive. Like, you know what I mean? You got Jeremy there, you got one guy who was at Usher at So Theatre there, you got Fraser's peeps, but then also you've got Ben Wishaw there, you know what I mean? You got James Corden, like, because we're all coming up and doing our thing and we just looked around. So, but no one's no one at that point, really. Yeah. And then the guy comes up to us, he goes, Look, I love the energy, I love the vibe that you've got here. Uh, let us know if you want to do something. And then me and Fraser and a friend. Who was this guy who said that? He was the manager of Rex Cinema. Bar. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, he just saw it. Do you know what I mean? Do you know yeah. what I mean? You could feel a, an energy. And I was like, I was like, 
me and Fraser, we sat down and my friend Jason, uh, who wasn't an actor, and then we just said, why don't we um, do this thing? And he was like, what the thing? I was like, well, why don't we do like a, like a club network thing of bringing people together? And so we started doing one a month at the Rec Cinema Bar. We did it for like oh, five or six years. Really? One a month, bringing 200 plus people into that venue. And you'd come at like uh, maybe nine nine there might be acoustic guitar I might have Craig there you know you, yeah. you'd be there like oh, just on a guitar for a bit having a pint you've invited people but that'd be the time where if you don't want the DJ noise you can just chat and have uh, some food and catch up with people come to 10 that's when a DJ would kick in but because we had a screening room we'd show a film as right. well so you had that thing of like you're coming out on a good night there's no name tags you know everyone there majority of people there we would know because they're on our guest list you know what I mean so you could just how do you know Trifles or how do you know Jimmy Fraser or Jason and that would be a way in you could talk to anybody but then also what you realise there was that uh, six degree separation so we might work together Craig but not seen each other for two years that yeah. you rock up because you know Fraser on another gig you're like Jimmy and yeah, so yeah, yeah. you had that sort of thing happening and so that went on just that uh, connecting no name tags just connecting people but then what happened you're walking down Soho like on Compton Street and see some young actor yeah Jimmy Fraser oh thanks for your event man it was great it's like yeah oh uh, wow what's going on oh we're all going up for Scorpion King 2 Jeremy met us that night and he's got us in and we're like brilliant man Go around another corner. Do you have any some girls? Yeah, man. We met this director. We got this job. And we're like, great. I'm like, this is brilliant. And then we're like, wait a minute. How come we ain't getting no jobs? <laughs> but we were like, that's brilliant. And then we said to ourselves, there it, there, 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 there's, there it is. Yeah, we've, we've built a network before we built a company. And then so suddenly, you know, it was like, what else can we do? We, what can we provide for the network? And then, uh, Fraser wrote a script for TV a comedy script and so we did a reading of it in the cinema space and invited BBC and execs you know again people on our mailing list and just fed it in and we did it there and then that that got commissioned and that almost got on telly and then suddenly we realised we've got the network so we can create platforms so the reason we did we did the reading is because Fraser's trying to get something off the ground but he's a new writer so we were like Oh, well, if we create platforms for new writers and actors. And so out of that, we started with uh, Monologue Slam. And Monologue Slam was a, was a free showcase to be seen by cast and directors, agents. I just want to say, a free showcase. Free, guys. I free. Mean, it's, Thank, seriously. I know, but it's like... Yeah. It, it blows yeah. my mind. I think it's fantastic because it's there. The door's like, come in. The door's open. Yeah, just come in. Come in. And also come in and be seen by the right people first of all we started and off with get like, advice and get advice off and mingle in the bar people. do you know what I mean yeah man from Line of Duty is here man <laughs> go, go talk to him do you know what I mean and like oh, oh he taught, he gave me some advice and so what we would do and we started off with 60 people in a bar in like Allgate then we went to uh, the Vibe Bar which was about 150 200 then we went to the Rich Mix which was about 350 to 400 uh, to 350 and then we went to Theatre Royal Stratford East which is about 500 you know and then we realised we can't just be in London be London centric yeah. but we're a small team but we, so we started hitting up Manchester and Birmingham and Leeds and you know and then the, 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 the smaller cities like Colchester Luton and, um, and then that was our thing for the actors and then we with the writing we decided to do the similar thing for writers you know putting them on like we started off doing plays like it's so theatre and we're in the afternoon we invite people to come see this new play that would be written by a new writer or even someone like Noel Clark coming up but no one would touch him in the theatre yet he's written a play so we put that on to try and get it on a, a reputable theatre but then the actors in the play would be actors that we've seen via monologue slam so the Trifles Craven Network is about harnessing and developing talent but also giving platforms for it so if we see three or four great actors in the monologue slam you know, we're always trying to try and get them in on our readings, you know? Yeah. And at the same time, the judges, the cast and directors like Ben Cogans and, you know, Sarah Crow, Shaheen Beggs, that would come to the monologue slam, we try and get them to the readings as well. So, as well as agents for writers. So you're getting, the writers getting a platform, but also the actors that are reading the writers' work are also getting a platform, you know? And then the next step, what happened is that, 
some actors start, a lot of actors write their own speeches for Monologue Slam we don't always know and some of them were amazing and then some of them started there were people in the audience going look mate if you ever want to I've got a nice little camera if you want to shoot that let us know and they started creating like short films for their monologues and so I had an idea I said why don't, why don't we do a short film festival you know and then we did that at the Mayfair Hotel one year and then the next year I approached BAFTA and now we do it at BAFTA every year and like just to come back a bit my you know Jimmy Nigerian British born East London you know Plasto Fraser you know mixed race from Leicester you know mum's white dad's Bayesian you know uh, when Jason was part of the company you know he, he, he's a he, from Cannontown black uh, Bayesian parents and then Minnie when she came on uh, Fraser's now wife Minnie Ayres she's from Nottingham right. a white woman you know working class so now Jason's not in the business so he He's got a family, he's not in it anymore, so it's me, Minnie, and Fraser. But all of us represent what trifles are, you know what I mean? So before, when it was just, when Jason Angle left the company, it was just me and Fraser, you would look at me and go, oh, black guy, Fraser, black guy, oh, mixed race, yeah, you know what, you know what I mean, <laughs> two black guys, you know what I mean? That's all we would get. And then people go, oh, it's a black thing though, isn't it? We can't come. I'm like, What? What, what, what it's you two it's a black thing I was like no we're like look at these pictures look how diverse yeah, yeah, yeah. like the audience are and look at the people that are on the stage doing the performances so early on we realised that we had to talk about inclusivity so we were saying this word 10 years before like yeah. this time you know because our families our friends represented that it was very inclusive it wasn't just like we just have black friends and you know what I mean you know it was like everybody was there from different backgrounds classes ages everything and so we said to ourselves that throughout everything that we do that's going to be the, f the forefront of it you know and, uh, and we said we want to do that because even though we were working Fraser was killing it he was on Smoking Room uh, the great series and uh, you know doing lots of film and whatnot. and we just said to ourselves that we can still see an issue in this industry you know which is about you know the lack of diversity and opportunity yeah. you know and but we had seen every now and then someone in the industry give us a tap do you know what I mean it might be Philip Headley or it might be um, who's who the guy that played Victor Meldrew Richard Wilson which is like, honestly <clears throat> crazy or something like Roxanne Silver or Kathy Burt like every now and then you might get a little pat and a little guidance here and we just said we just said look, well look the more we work and we're fortunate we're working we're not at the top the people at the top probably could do much more than what we're doing but they're not doing it yeah. if no one else is going to do it we'll do we'll it, do it. Yeah. and that's what we do and so me being on Holby for three years the, of course within that time we've had the whole of the Holby City casting department as well as the doctor's department and the EastEnders I'm going to get Julia Cramps yeah I'm going to get her there you know and because that's my job as Triforce and also that's I, I, I believe in it because if we can get some of these actors seen by those casting directors then we are doing our job and we've had success stories like Chizzy Akadulu she did Monologue Slam Liz, Liz Stoll saw her got her in two, three, four months later and now she was a regular she's a regular in Holby you know so like when you say why did we do it it organically grew and then we 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 quickly learnt our place within the industry yeah but also Craig we've never had any funding mate we would, we'd use our own money or we would cover everything be able to get a little cheeky cab home when that's a good night yeah you know what I mean and then yeah. as you got older you're like that's not a business model but then we were like we we believed and we were so deep in it, it was like we can't stop but what was really nice is that the Paul Hamlin Foundation, I don't know if you know this organization, uh, they like put uh, money into charities and buildings like the uh, like theaters at the National, uh, National Portrait Gallery. They're huge. We had to go and someone nominated us and then we had to go and pitch them for a quarter of a million pounds. And we just said, and we, you know, we're like, we don't really know what we're doing, but we're going to look like what we know what we're doing. So, yeah. you, know? you know, it's so funny. Like, Minnie's sort of very spreadsheets and, you know, very good with the detail and admin. Fraser's very, you know, he's a very good with ideas and sort of the, I feel like the words, the, like, the, the ethos of our company. And I always feel like I'm sort of almost like the people person and, and the connections and stuff like that. So we're sort of like a, a Marvel team. Do you know what I mean? And so we're there. And all actors as well. We're working actors 
you know, we call ourselves inside, out, inside outsiders, but then we're on the outside because we're trying to go, look, you know, we're an organisation here and we have no funding, but we're across Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, London. You, you know, name it. You know, we're, we're probably we're, around. Yeah, we're not <laughs> far from anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. We're not far from anywhere. We now ha- we know how to execute events. You know, we can, we can work with budgets, you know. Something that looks too big, we can get it done, you know, and save money. Uh, we've got outcomes. Here are our outcomes. We've got a network. There's over 50,000 people and growing. You, you know what I mean? It's like... We had it all there, and it's weird until you, you talk about it, you forget. You sometimes you do forget how much you've done and what you're doing. Yeah. And we got that quarter of a million, you know, and and that's the first time we've ever got funding. It's amazing. People said, "Why not the Arts Council?" We just felt like they, they wouldn't. I don't know. We just felt like we couldn't in some way, so we didn't bother, and we were just getting on to do it. Yeah. We felt, you know, some things can hold you back. We just said, "Let's let's just get on and do it." And because when you've got two hundred people coming and to the networking nights we're charged like 10 pounds but then also you would have to be a member to get in that place so our name again has got you access to a, a venue that you couldn't get into you know and so when i why that's why i love that the film festival is one of the cheapest i feel in the uk you know for short films but it's at bafta when i ask the filmmakers how many people here are, are members like a small percentage put their hands up. So again, for the day we take over BAFTA on the 2nd of December, and you're bringing in young, older, all sorts of act, um, filmmakers from across the UK, and they're having a day at BAFTA, you know? So again, we're like, we're smashing down that wall of access, yeah. you know? And meeting so many different people in that yeah. environment. Again, connectivity, connectivity, which is how it all started. Started, yeah. yeah. And like, we've got the BFI there, we've got Film London there, you know? We, we get the top sort of the funding bodies there to do talks. So it's that thing of like, on, on our panels, we, the day starts off with, from 10 till 6, we have panels and showing the finest films. So the panel might be how to get funding for short films and features. And so we make sure we get all the top people talking to these people that don't know of them or know of them but feel, ah, they're not for me. They're not going to give me money. But yeah. then we're going to get them to say, this is how you get money from us, you yeah. know, and give them that information. And so we have all different sort of... Uh, uh, panel discussions uh, throughout the day and then the evening we have the red carpet gala where we bring in like you know some named actors and the finest films and also potential sponsor people for the next year and uh, and yeah and we've got with no BAFTA members are there from for the whole day and I feel proud of that just because a lot of people it is a big day out for them you know to yeah. say your film's been shown at BAFTA it's a big deal and you know what I mean we all like to have a little dress up put on a little blazer and you know Hit the town. <laughs> Jimmy, uh, it's amazing what you do, and I'm so thankful that you took time to come on and chat. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much you. for coming on, man. Man, we did it. Thank we you so it. much. <laughs> Cheers, man. Cheers. Thank you. How much fun is Jimmy Akinpola to spend time with? I really hope that came across on the episode because I loved recording it. It was a joy. I mean, he's so infectious with his energy and his positivity. And he, it's not that he rams it down his throat. It's just because he's there. It, it bleeds out of him and it's all truthful and it's brilliant. And this is a guy who got up off his ass and went, right, I'm going to try and create something. I'm going to try and do something. I'm going to try and help people. And he does do that. So, Jimmy, if you're listening, thanks so much for coming on, man. It was a joy. And I hope you enjoyed listening to it. Thank you for downloading and subscribing. I hope that put a spring in your step today. Now, look, that's it. That's episode 49 done. You know where to follow us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Email, you know, it's twoshotpod at gmail.com. Look, I've got it down. But listen... Next week is very special. But why, 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 Craig? Why is it it special? Because we're having a party and we want you to come. Get your party poppers, get your hats, any, anything to celebrate. Because it is the Two Shot Podcast first year anniversary birthday party. And you're invited. I'm going to let you know more about it very, very soon. Get excited. Until next week, I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff. And this has been the Two Shot Podcast. Do take care of yourself. 
Stay positive. I'll see you next week. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. 